Hello. Well, Christmas is over for another year. I'm just taking the decorations off the tree and then I'm going to throw it away. It's difficult to imagine Christmas without a Christmas tree. But we've had them in England only for about the last hundred years or so. We copied the custom from the Germans in the time of Queen Victoria. It's a very interesting story. Victoria was only 18 when she became Queen of England. Two years later, she announced that she wanted to marry her cousin, Prince Albert of saxe coburg in Germany. The people of England did not like the idea of their young queen marrying a foreigner. But Victoria had made up her mind, and before long they were married. Soon, the first of their children were born, and the family began to spend Christmas at Windsor Castle. You may open your eyes now, children. Oh, what a pretty tree. Presents. <laughs> oh, Albert, you were right to insist upon it. Of course, my dear. Look how the children like the tree. Oh, you must agree with me that uh, Christmas would not be the same without a Christmas tree. It's a pretty, pretty sight. Hmm. What have you found, Vicky? Sweets, nuts, fruit. May we eat them, Papa? Oh, you may eat the sweets, you may eat the nuts, and you may eat the fruit. But not today. We'll have to wait until the twelfth days of Christmas have passed. Until the twelfth night. Oh, Papa, do we have to wait all that time? Bertie, today is the day when we have presents. Let's see what we can find for you. Yes, today is the day for presents and your big English plum pudding. But your German tree will stand there for all the twelfth days of Christmas. Now I will light the candles. <clears throat> Papa, did you have a tree when you were small? Oh, indeed so, my dear. Always in Germany at Christmas time, they go out into the woods and bring in a tree for Christmas. And then the grown-ups secretly hang on the pretty nuts and fruit. And do you know what we say when we light the candles? We say, look, we have brought the Christmas stars into the house. My dear, it's a beautiful custom. We must have your German tree for Christmas every year. So, Victoria and Albert made the German tree part of their Christmas at Windsor. And before long, families all over England were doing the same. I think we ought to say thank you to Prince Albert for giving us the Christmas tree. He was a very clever man, but he didn't get an opportunity to do any great work because people were suspicious of him being a foreigner. So he was very pleased when the Royal Society of Arts ex invited him to be their president. What did the Royal Society of Arts do? Well, we must remember that this was a time of great inventions with railway engines, machines, factories. And they wanted to encourage people to design better and more beautiful objects like tables and chairs, even cups and saucers. Well, they did this by holding competitions and giving prizes. At first, only a few people took part. But by 1849, Prince Albert and the Royal Society of Arts had great plans for the future. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Phipps. Thank you. I did send to Mr. Cole, as you asked, sir, to arrange details for the next meeting of the Royal Society. Good, good. As a matter of fact, he has arrived back from Paris this morning and has called at the palace to see me. Would you care to speak to him yourself? Of course, of course. Bring him up, please. He is just the gentleman I want to see. Uh. Oh, so very good of you to come, Mr. Cole. 
Thank you. And what of Paris? So oh, very well worth the visit, sir. You know, the French manage their exhibition splendidly. Beautiful displays of glassware, silver, lace work, the highest quality exhibits from all over France. Oh. And you will write this in your report to the society? Oh, without delay, sir. It'll be ready for the meeting tomorrow. Oh, good. Now, also, I want our exhibition to include all types of manufacture. Uh, machinery, inventions, art and sculpture. Now, if every craftsman is invited to send his work to us, then maybe we shall have um, an exhibition as important as the French in Paris. Now, we shall need a large space for this. Um, I had thought about Leicester Square. We could build a large building, a large hall, and this could be used for exhibitions in the future. Now, what do you think, Mr. Cole? Indeed, indeed, sir, but um, well, I had wondered, with respect, sir, if we might not go even further than the French. Well, how so? Well, it is said that a Monsieur Buffet, a new minister in France, I believe, wanted to invite all countries to display in the Paris exhibition, but the French manufacturers would have none of it. Need we be so cautious? Have you considered, sir, that our exhibition of 1851 might be open to all nations? Indeed, indeed then we must decide which it is to be, a national exhibition for Britain alone or an international e exhibition, open for the whole world. It must embrace foreign productions. International, certainly, Mr. Cole. We must encourage all nations to send us their manufacturers of uh, art and sculpture and science. And there could be uh, prizes for the best in each division. Then... Do you consider that Leicester Square will be large enough, sir? Oh, certainly not. If we are to uh, display the works of all nations, then we will require a magnificently large building. Uh, where shall it be? In Hyde Park, sir. I consider Hyde Park the only possible site with space enough for what we require. Good, good. Then uh, may I ask you, Mr. Cole, to make uh, all uh, arrangements and inquiries for Hyde Park? Indeed. And we will uh, tell uh, these proposals to the other members of the society when we meet them. An international exhibition for the works of all nations in Hyde Park in 1851. So it was no, I, I, that I, Prince I, Albert Prince. and Mr. Henry Cole began to plan the first exhibition ever to be held of the works of all nations. Joseph Paxton designed a building of glass on an iron framework. When people complained that tall elm trees would have to be cut down, he altered his design to include a high arch to rise right over them. Prince Albert, as chairman of the commissioners in charge, often went along to see how the work was going. Meanwhile, exhibits from all over the world were being carefully packed into crates and sent off to London. And soldiers helped to unload them at Hyde Park. So, by April 1851, the magnificent glass building was finished. People called it the Crystal Palace. On May the 1st, all was ready for the Queen to declare the exhibition open. The site as we came to the centre, facing the beautiful crystal fountain, was magic and impressive. The tremendous cheering, the joy expressed in every face, the vastness of the building with all its decorations and exhibits. And my beloved husband was the creator of this peace festival, uniting all nations of the earth. Albert had season ticket number one. This cost three guineas. And visitors signed the book as they came in. The first month, the entrance fee was five shillings a day. When it was reduced to one shilling, Hyde Park was busy with horse buses. Ordinary people travelled by train for the first time in their lives to visit the exhibition. 
farmers and workmates saved to come up to London together. They saw things they had never seen before, for only very rich people could go abroad at that time. It was before the days of photographs and films. Only a few books had pictures to show what people, places and objects really looked like. The medieval court was set out like the palaces and churches of the Middle Ages. But there were also halls displaying the latest inventions in machinery. In the hardware section, Mr. Chubb showed locks for all kinds of doors. This handsome lock was intended for a fine house. It was most useful, but also part of the decoration of the room and Mr. Chubb was kind enough to demonstrate some of his clever locks to me. He constructed a cage for the Koh-i-Noor diamond, which I loaned to the exhibition. When the exhibition closed at night, the diamond on its velvet stand sank automatically into a safe below. The Queen admired the beautiful dressing cases which Mr. Asprey had on display. This one in particular contained everything that a lady of high position could need. Her mirror, two holders for candles in silver gilt, crystal jars for her creams and powders, a writing set with pen, pencils, rulers, even a stamp holder. There were also trays of brushes and combs. And all the implements a lady required for all types of fine sewing and embroidery. Scissors, thimbles. There were even secret drawers in which she could keep her letters and jewels. There was so much to see and admire. It was sad to think that after the closing ceremony on October the 15th, my husband's wonderful creation would be over. But what a success it has been. Gentlemen, I would like to thank in particular Mr. Henry Cole, who was one of the few who originated the idea, and Mr. Joseph Paxton for giving us a building so well suited to our needs. Yeah. Our grateful thanks to both of you. And now, gentlemen, to money matters. Um, Earl Granville, would you please give the report of the Financial Committee? Yes, certainly. <coughs> Your Highness, gentlemen, it is my pleasant task to report, as you will see from the reports in front of you, a most satisfactory state of affairs. Our total expenditure has amounted to 335,742 pounds. Of this, the building and fittings accounted for £170,000. We have been generously assisted by many donations, as you will observe. But the financial success of this exhibition has been guaranteed by the attendance of no less than six million thirty-nine thousand. 195 persons. Mm -hmm. Thus, our total receipts amount to 522,179 pounds. And so, after all major expenses paid, we hold the handsome profit of 186,437 Pounds. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. A very satisfactory report. 
And now it is our duty, gentlemen, today to decide how we are going to spend this vast sum of money which has been given by the people of this country in support of the exhibition. Uh, Mr. Cole. Sir, when the idea of the, the exhibition was first suggested, there were some who said it would fail. They said ordinary people would not come. They said there would be stealing and damage, fighting, even riots, nothing of the sort. Our people have shown that they are interested in art and in science, that they are prepared to travel long distances to see objects of beauty and usefulness. Now, we must encourage that interest with this money. I suggest a permanent exhibition with the finest objects we can acquire. Permanently on show at the Crystal Palace, part of which can be used as a winter garden. And very popular that would be with Londoners in winter. Yes, I agree, a permanent exhibition, but not, I fear, in the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park. Because, you see, gentlemen, when we first drew out the lease, we promised that the, uh, the palace would not take up any room in the park more than temporarily. And we must stand by this promise. Uh, Mr. Fuller. Our object in holding the exhibition was to encourage good workmanship in our, workman in our workshops and factories. Had we not better put the money to schools and colleges for the training of our young people in science? Oh, and art, I hope, Mr. Fuller. And music. Assuredly, we need a college of music and, and concert halls where people may come to hear the finest singers and musicians in the world. Yes. We need a vast centre for art, science and music. Well, I think that uh, Granville can help us in this... Uh, could you give yes, us the report yes. on the core estate, uh, please? Yes, uh, gentlemen, if I may draw your attention <coughs> to the map here, mm -hmm. you will see due south of Hyde Park is the Gore Estate. Mm. And this area here comprising 87 acres. It is about to be up for sale. Now, the Prince has advised us to purchase this land for the schemes proposed by yourself, Mr. Cole, and by Mr. Fuller. Yeah. Yes. It is indeed my advice that we should buy this land in South Kensington while it is still on the market. And I have every hope that with the help of Her Majesty's government, we will see there one day erected the schools and the colleges, the exhibition halls, that we wish to provide for our people. Yes. And this is what happened. The commissioners bought 87 acres of land in Kensington to the south of Hyde Park. And gradually, the museums and colleges we know so well were built. The Victoria and Albert Museum. The Science Museum. Natural History Museum. The Royal College of Music. The Albert Hall. And the memorial to Albert himself. So, we go to the museums in South Kensington to see interesting and beautiful objects. We go to the Albert Hall to listen to music and attend concerts. And I'm sure this would have pleased Prince Albert and the friends of the Royal Society of Arts because they started it all. Goodbye. <laughs>